and so that the perception is in this upper right hand quadrant for a company and you get these desirable behaviours. Cooperative effort to strengthen the tribe, personal sacrifice, symbols and symbolic actions become more important. There is a common enemy. Urgency to change, individuals hone their skills, tribal symbols are reaffirmed, strategies are redefined, relationships are reviewed and improved. That means strategic partnerships in a business sense. KCPs know how to motivate change and have a playbook or a means to avoid and overcome resistance. This is a red squirrel. All you Spanish people are familiar with them. The squirrels that exist here in the Iberian Peninsula, most of Europe. This guy here is the gray squirrel. He is an invader from the United States. And gray squirrels were first introduced about here in southwest London in 1876, some rich person decided, I've got red squirrels uh, you know, in my stately home. Wouldn't it be cute if I also had gray squirrels? We could have like two colors. So they brought some gray squirrels from North America, and a few other rich people copied this behavior, and it, it caused a, an ecological disaster. Now, the reason isn't that the gray squirrel's a little bit bigger and tougher and competes for the nuts better, it's mainly because the gray squirrel carries a disease to which it's immune, but the red squirrels aren't. So the red squirrels have been dying. And the, um, in Ireland here, the, the uh, gray squirrel invasion can be tracked down to only three pairs, six individuals introduced in a rich person's stately home here in the center of the island of Ireland. Europe has largely survived because of the English Channel, but there has been some introduction of gray squirrels into northern Italy. It's been illegal to import gray squirrels since the, 18, since the 1930s, since before World War II. It's illegal to bring gray squirrels from North America. Um, but if the gray squirrel gets into Europe, it'll cause a lot of trouble. Anyway, this is a metaphor. You start with what you do now. What you do now, that's the red squirrel. And you introduce the new way of doing it. That's the gray squirrel. So when we're, uh, we're driving change, when we're helping people decide, what do you do now? What do you leave until later? And what do you not do at all? We don't come along and say, oh, the way you're prioritizing is wrong. You need to stop doing that. Switch to this other way. No, we just teach them a new way of thinking about it. And that's called cost of delay. And cost of delay is related to triage. The concept of what do we do now, what should we leave until later, and what do we not do at all. Triage comes from the Crimean War, the field hospitals there. And how do you decide the cost of delay? It's the rate that the soldier lying on the floor in the hospital is bleeding to death. If that's too fast, sorry, there's nothing we can do. If it's reasonably fast, we need to act now. And if it's a lot slower, we can leave them until later. So, cost of delay is about understanding metaphorically what is the rate you're bleeding to death. And once we teach people to understand that, then they can start to do it. Meanwhile, they've got their return on investment prioritization with their spreadsheets, their business value divided by their cost. It's all bullshit. They made up the, the numerator. They have some vague clue about the denominator, but we know it's wrong. So a complete fantasy number divided by a wrong number equals a fact. And then we stack rank things according to that ratio. If that had been working, businesses wouldn't need to be doing business agility transitions. So we don't tell them it's wrong because they'll get upset about that. We just teach them the new way of doing it. And you know what? About six weeks later, they've stopped doing the old way. The gray squirrel replaces the red squirrel if it's fitter for the environment. And nobody asked anybody to change. KCPs know how to drive this kind of change. In fact, they have a whole playbook of different ways of driving change that we teach them. Avoiding the rock, the emotional resistance for change, the gray squirrel, red squirrel thing. So the um, limbic brain, 
System one, exposure, emotional engagement. Politicians understand this. If you won't pay higher taxes to improve public infrastructure to reduce the traffic jams on your way to work in the morning, politicians let you stew in it. Let's just allow it to get worse and worse. And eventually, people will actually vote for higher taxes to pay for the improvements. The Galapagos Island effect, isolate the, the mutant, the change, give it a chance to survive and thrive and prove it's worth, worth the alpha geek solution. Find the leader of the pack, convince them everyone else follows, but only if it's a highly cohesive social group which means you need to understand how to improve social cohesion. Coached identity change, invoke a stronger emotion, never waste a good punctuation point. A punctuation point's anything like political change, regulatory change, you fired the CEO, an acquisition, a takeover, all these kind of things. We have a whole playbook of these. But the really dramatic ones are only at the bottom because we want you to try the simple things first. Don't reorg. That's a punctuation point. All right? Kanban coaches have six or seven things they can suggest before you even get there. Where the competition walk in and say, the first thing you guys need to do is reorg. Basically, the first thing you need to do is the hard shit. Because as a consultant, I don't, need, I don't know how to teach you the simple stuff. Well, Kanban coaches, we fixed that. They know how to teach you the much simpler stuff. Right. Now, this is a Northern European proverb. The Germans claim it, the Scandinavians claim it, and the Scottish claim it. My view on this is we'll let the Germans and the Scandinavians fight it out, and then we'll declare victory. There's no such thing as bad weather, only inappropriate clothing. There's no such thing as bad Kanban, only inappropriate practices. You got the wrong advice, you're not ready for something yet. Or, it's too easy for you, it doesn't create enough stress. And if you're not stressed, you're not motivated to make improvements. Right? KCPs know how to guide, manage devolution. They know when to recommend the appropriate practices. That's the key skill, it's about appropriateness. If it's too easy, it doesn't make a difference. And if it's too hard, you choke on it and you abandon it before it really makes a difference. The trick is this sports coaching skill of knowing the current level you're at, pushing you just a little bit out of your comfort zone so that you get better. Just enough stress to provoke the next level of improvement. How many of you here have kids? Kids that are in some kind of sport, might be football or gymnastics or something like that. Do you watch how the coaches do, do that with your kids? How they develop them? How they get them to be better? They don't teach them really advanced stuff that they see the professionals doing on TV, at least not initially, and certainly not with gymnastics. They have to push them a little bit. If you're going to teach a kid about this big, how to turn a cartwheel on a four-inch beam this high off the ground, that's scary. And they need to be introduced to it gently. But if you're ever going to get them to do it, you need to push them out of their comfort zone. There has to be enough stress. Now, what happens if the gymnastics coach stresses your eight-year-old too much? And you show up at the end of the, uh, the session to collect your kid, and she comes running off the, the mats in tears. Mommy, mommy, I hate gymnastics. I'm never going back. So we recognize two key failure modes in agile coaching and Kanban coaching. Not enough stress, nothing gets better. False summit plateau, we've done Kanban. It was good. We love a bit of transparency. And then the overreaching problem, because you've got some coach who read all the books, attended all the conferences. They are the smartest guy in the room, and they want you to, to get to maturity level four or five like this. And you're not ready for it yet. 
you're that kid running off the mats at the end of gymnastics crying and saying you're never going back. So appropriateness is the key skill. And we've been teaching that to coaches since 2009. Right, so KCPs come rich with metaphor. We've made them watch a whole bunch of movies and understand how Bruce Lee is related to Justin Bieber. <laughs> right, so hire a, hire a metaphor-enabled KCP. This is one from, uh, from Hamburg in Germany. His wife is also here, and she'll take orders. Sitting at the back there, Susanna. She's happy to... Um, to take your inquiries about hiring Andreas. And you'll be sorted. Without doubt, the best KCPs we have in the world, some of them are in the room here today, they will fix your problems. They will make your business agile. They will take your 600, 1,200, several thousand people organizations, and they'll make it agile. And tomorrow you're going to hear from a whole bunch of those people who've done that already with big companies. You take a look at our program, you see the list there. Because it's pragmatic, it's actionable, but it's evidence-based. We have the evidence here. So that was wonderful, yet it's rather self-serving. And it lacks pragmatism, right? Because they, hey, just hire a KCP. Well, there's only 111 of them right now. There might be three more by Wednesday. <laughs> so we needed something better than that, right? I mean, yes, hire a KCP. I would encourage you to do that. But we needed something that democratized what they know and what I've been teaching them for the last 10 years. Uh, and the answer to that is the Kanban maturity model. And we're launching the 1.0 version today. The assets are available to download off the website. The second edition of the book won't be available probably until September. You have a copy of one of the posters. And uh, the rest of the stuff is, is online. So Kanban maturity model, we, uh, we built this idea of understanding how businesses perform and codified it into seven levels. There were many things that inspired this, and I don't have time to get into the detail on the references, but it goes uh, through oblivious, we're just not organized at all, it's anarchy, team-focused, customer-driven. Customer-driven, yes, but you know what? If we were, say we are a pizza business, Customer comes in, they order a pizza, they ask for ham and pineapple. And there's about an 80% chance they actually got ham and pineapple. There's a 20% chance we accidentally put some pepperoni on there. Or it took us an hour to make it because we lost our order and then found it later. Or then they complained and we're like, oh yeah, that's coming right out. So we started making it again. Customer driven. We understand there's customers, but we're not good at serving them. Level three, fit for purpose. We understand there's customers and they actually get what they ask for. We, we meet their expectations. This is a good place to be, but it's not particularly sustainable because there's been some great customer service businesses in recent years. One of them was Uber. Well, when the founder, Travis Kalanick, was in charge of Uber, the drivers were sleeping in their vehicles. They were often working two shifts. Of course, they're unregulated. Some of them were working as taxi drivers, a regulated industry, for eight hours, and then working as an Uber driver for another eight hours. When they were tired, they're sitting there with the Red Bull while they're driving you, trying to stay awake. Um, they weren't earning enough money to service their vehicles. They weren't earning enough money to replace their vehicles. Uber was lending them the money to replace their vehicles because the banks wouldn't. And therefore, Uber drivers were becoming, uh, they were its indentured servitude. They are slaves. Their business was inherently fragile. Travis Kalanick had to be replaced with Dara Khosra Shahi. And since then, Uber starts to behave like a level four business. They start to play nice with regulators. They start to recognize they're in a regulated industry. Their prices had to go up. They had to make the business sustainable. 
Level three might be good customer service, but it could be martyrdom. Uh, so level four is risk hedged. We appreciate there's a whole bunch of stakeholders we have to serve. Level five is the market leader. If you are racing Formula One and you're Mercedes, this is where you are. Not everyone cares about this for their business. Level four is a pretty good place to be. And then uh, we recognize this concept of level six. We call it built for survival, but it's about reinvention. And level six leadership isn't needed all that often. A Lou Gerstner who reinvents IBM, a Nelson Mandela who reinvents South Africa. Right, that's the kind of level we're talking about there. It's very high. Level four is a good achievement. And you'll notice on the big poster, not the small one we've given you, but if you download the big one, or we have the big one maybe on the wall somewhere here, you'll see it in our office tonight at the party. Uh, we only elaborate the four levels in the latest version. We've sort of kept level five and six up our sleeve for our future release. Uh, we needed to codify this playbook what KCPs know, as I said. And the Kanban maturity model now maps, I think it's 156 practices against these seven levels. So now, someone who's trained in this, they might have read the book, they might have taken a training class, they look at the organization they're in and they say, sort of, roughly, where are we at? And if you assess that you're level one, maybe two, you probably shouldn't try the level three and four practices yet. Try to get good at the things that are at level one and two until you're ready for the next level. Now, it took us 12 years to learn this stuff. It took us more than two, about two and a half years to codify it and put it together, to test it in the market. We've been testing it with companies like BBVA here in town, uh, Vanguard and JP Morgan in the United States, um, Zurich Insurance. Um, some of the, those case studies you'll see in the conference. This is a, a quote from Amazon, a review of the book. These are probably the only agile consultants that do not push their own unique jargon and solutions because they know what they are doing. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Amanda's here, actually, to present the Petrobras story, but we liked her quote from reviewing the book. Kanban maturity models agile for adults, for grown-ups. Uh, we're not facilitating ceremonies here. We're changing business outcomes. The Kanban maturity model exists to provide actionable guidance. Given where you are, the KMM suggests what you can and should do next. So it solves these two failure modes. The false summit plateau? No, there's an entire map of things you could be doing to improve your business results. And it solves the smartest guy in the room problem of your coach encouraged you to go too far too soon. It makes that much more obvious. And from a customer perspective, you now have something that enables you to hold your consultants accountable. If you're going to have an army of people earning 300,000 US dollars a year as contractors, wouldn't it be good if there was actually a way of measuring whether those people actually knew anything and were giving you good advice? The KMM, yeah, we've seen that. Did I go the wrong way there? Yeah, 12 years of real world case studies, observed behavior, outcomes, and empirical evidence. All right, so it provides a roadmap. And this takes away a lot of the fear, because evolutionary change sounds a bit scary. So David, tell me, what's the outcome going to be? Well, you're going to get better than you are now. Oh, what do you mean exactly? How will we know when we're finished? Which is a bit of a stupid question when you're talking about evolutionary change. Evolution, when will we know we're done? So the whole evolutionary change message was scary for people, but now we have a map and it says, if you would like a fully risk-hedged business where all your stakeholders are happy, your customers love you, and it's entirely sustainable for a very long time into the future, we call that level four. And here's a map. And if you can do those things, you'll get there. Oh, and here's a case study that tells you about a company that's already done it. 
It takes away the fear. It makes it more of a guided evolution and potentially that there's some target, but the target's a business outcome. It's not practice adoption. Uh, so it provides this ladder to resolve this structural tension of where we are now and where we want to be. Because if you're currently level one, and the, uh, he's not here, Jose Casal, is he? But he, he, he's a consultant in London, Spanish guy. Well, one of his financial clients came up to him and said, Jose, we love this KMM thing you're talking about. We think we're level two. We'd like you to take us to level four. Well, first of all, there's, there's coded language there. We think we are level two. That translates as we are level one. So we're level one. We'd like you to take us to level four. You know, set course for maturity level four, warp factor three, engage. That's a recipe for failure. The, the, there's too much tension there. <clears throat> stretching too much. That's the little girl running off at the end of gymnastics crying, saying, I hate gymnastics. I'm never coming back. Uh, but we can take that away because, hey, if you're level one and you aspire to level four, let's try for level two. Let's see if we can make that work. And if we make that work, how about we try for level three? Takes away a lot of the tension, just enough stress to provoke you to get better, and not too much that you break. All right, so back to the cartoon, what maturity level is this organization? In the interests of time here, I'll tell you that they're not level three or four. They might be level two, because they've got workflow. Uh, but on the other hand, they might be level one. We don't have quite enough evidence. It's only a cartoon. Um, however, they're prepared to do something about it. We see that the elements here, they've got, they've got uh, some visualization on what they're doing, they've got some stress, they've got a reflection mechanism, they've got an active leadership. And potentially this is a whoops, level two organization moving to level three. You'll see that when you, you look at the, the detail of this or uh, in Theodora's presentation. We've also codified this evolutionary change model. Steve and I did this in Bilbao uh, about a year ago now, June of last year, um, in an apartment I'd rented over on Ricaldi for the locals who might actually care. Um, so the idea is that you've got an organization that's usually pretty happy. They're team-focused, they're maturity level one. We've got hundreds of agile teams and lots of little smiley faces on our Nicky Nicky calendars or whatever they're called. We've got all these happy teams. Of course, the business isn't actually improving. Um, now we need to disrupt that a bit. We need to push some practices on those people to make them unhappy with the status quo but they're probably fearful of the future. What do you mean we need to collaborate with other teams? What do you mean we need to care about customer metrics? So we need to get them over that, and that's the opportunity for the coach. All right, so we introduce the stressors, we disrupt them a bit, and then we consolidate them to the next level with some coaching. All right, so this is where there's still a role for Andreas, we haven't completely replaced him. Or for that matter, Peter and Xiaomi, who've probably been sitting there thinking, oh my God, we're, we're going to lose our jobs at Zurich. They're just going to read this book and use the posters. All right, so the idea is you're at level one, we disrupt it a bit, we consolidate, get you to level two. Now you're at level two, we introduce a bunch of the practices there in the transition level. We disrupt that and we, we consolidate again, we get you to level three and we've codified all these practices. And we codified them by seeing them in the stories that we've documented. Case studies we've had written that we've commissioned or we've done ourselves or uh, we have 12 years of conference material, 11, 11 years of conference material and videos like the one we're making now. Uh, we have lots of evidence to have built this, and it took us two and a half years to have some confidence that we think we've got it right. So we've now codified the coaching practices for 
taking the level you're at, disrupting it, and consolidating it to the next level. So it's not just the practices the organization should be adopting that are repeatable. It's the practices the coaches should be using with you, which are also repeatable. All right. So tales of transition. These are real ones, right? ML1 to ML2. Every team reports that they deliver on their commitments, but I know that customers are waiting longer than six months for delivery. And this was an agile coach at an internet equipment manufacturer in the suburbs of Boston. Very famous internet equipment manufacturer. And he was like, Psst. he took me out in the corridor and he said, you know, everyone in there says we meet our sprint commitments and they're all very proud of the Scrum implementation, but I've got to tell you, customers are waiting six months. We deliver something every two weeks and we don't really, we're just kidding ourselves. That's maturity level one, okay. So you might have a board that looks like this, a next, this is your sprint backlog and in progress and done. And what's wrong here, the diagnosis, lack of service orientation, localized metrics and objectives, no customer recognizable work items, lack of collaboration across service delivery workflow. Because why are those customers waiting for six months? Because hey, our team finished in two weeks. The fact that the next team in the, you know, down the line, they didn't pick the work up for another two months, well, they finished in two weeks, and everyone reports we're finishing in two weeks, and the customer's like, you guys are jokers. I've been waiting here for six months. All right, so what do we do about it? Static, that's short for the system thinking approach to implementing Kanban. We teach that in our basic training. There's a whole bunch of Kanban trainers in the room here that teach those exercises. <coughs> Customer recognizable work item types. It's not a task. It's not a ticket in JIRA. Uh, your customer walks into Starbucks. They order a cup of coffee. The work item's called a, a drink or a cup of coffee. Right? Service-oriented workflow board. In other words, what you're tracking on the board should be the thing the customer cares about. And a system capability review, which is basically saying, okay, we make cups of coffee for our customers. How good are we at doing that? And if we're not good enough at it, how do we get better? And this takes you to something that will look more like this. Level 2, maturity Kanban board whole bunch of different teams collaborating in a workflow. Uh, team one here, team two, team three. And we call this an aggregated team Kanban board. It's a pattern. So Kanban design patterns are part of the Kanban maturity model. What about level two to level three? I haven't looked at the lead time chart in months. This was a software development manager at Huawei in China. And what's wrong there? Well, basically, nobody actually cares how fast they get it done. No one's holding them accountable for the customer expectations. So is there a service delivery manager role present? In other words, is there someone responsible for taking the customer's order and actually ensuring whether we delivered it or not? Because often in siloed organizations, that doesn't exist, and therefore nobody actually cares about whether we delivered to the customer. And hence, the customers report things like, this has taken six months, and it should have been about two weeks. Are the customer expectations understood and communicated? Well, if there's no one actually too bothered about the customer, probably not. And is there a service delivery review happening? So system capability review, you turn that up a notch. And now we say, okay, we've got a customer. The customer expects delivery within three months. How good are we at doing that? That's the stressor and the reflection mechanism, service delivery review. So these things are about injecting the right stressors and the right reflection mechanism. Then all you need is an act of leadership, someone who says, let's do something about it. Is there any blocker management? Is blocker likelihood and impact being reported? Is there a risk review? Is the lead time distribution thin or fat-tailed? It's a little bit mathematical, but it basically means if we're recording how long it takes to do something and we build a 
uh, a histogram of that, does the histogram have a long tail out here? And this is the item that took a year and a half. And we don't like that. It's unpredictable. These are all practices that are codified in the KMM. So what do we do here? We implement the service delivery manager role. We implement the service delivery review meeting practice. We implement some blocker metrics, the risk review practice. Um, we capture customer expectations and their fitness criteria. What is the customer expecting in order to be happy? And we use that as the stressor. All of this is codified, those 156 practices. It's a lookup table. All right, Tales of Transition, level three to four. We just put out a release on time, met our commitments, but our product management team reacted with a WTF is this. This is actually captured in one of our case studies you can download from our website. It's a company called Mobila in Berlin. It's a subsidiary of eBay. And work items weren't meaningful and understood by the customer, in this case the internal customer, the product managers. There was asynchronous commitment. Basically, the product managers would say, we want this, and we want this, and we want this. And at some separate time, the development team would come along and say, oh, they want that. Oh, yeah, I fancy that one right now. Let's take that one. And then they'd break it up into a whole bunch of user stories. And they would show up on their Kanban board. And the customers had no idea what this stuff was and what it related to. And consequently, they put a release out on schedule, and the marketing people are like, what? Who told you to do this? Well, they told themselves to do it. Well, it's a failure. But that's a level three to four failure. All right, so pull from part, yeah, I've explained that. All right, implement two-tiered Kanban board. That's what they did. New coarse-grained work item type, feature something the customer cares about. Synchronous commitment. Let's put the customers and the development team in the same room at the same time so that they can say, we want this feature. And, oh, yeah, we'll do it for you then. Full replenishment meeting with customers. That's what I've just described. The synchronous commitment, the idea that both sides commit at the same time. And the customers are committing to the coarse-grained work item that they understand, the feature they want not some user stories they don't understand. And that fixes the problem. And all these practices are codified in the model. OK, so where did we start at the beginning here? If only there was a way to avoid the need for senior executive support. Well, now there is. We call that the Kanban maturity model. If only there was a way to avoid or overcome resistance to change. Well, now there is. We've codified it in the Kanban maturity model. If only there was a means to build more trust. Well, now there is. We've codified it in the Kanban maturity model. If only we had better KPIs. If you've read Fit for Purpose, you understand that we've codified that, the Fit for Purpose framework into the Kanban maturity model. If only we had a way to encourage teams to collaborate with each other. That's like maturity level one to two. We've codified it in the Kanban maturity model. If only we had more leadership. Steve's going to present our leadership model a little later, and that's the leadership practices extension for the Kanban maturity model, and we'll publish that in the second half of this year. You, you're the first to see it um, as a conference presentation today. If only we had fewer dependencies. Well, we've got something called Enterprise Services Planning. Alexei Zhegloff was teaching that over in our training center um, in downtown Bilbao here last week. And we've codified that in the Kanban maturity model, although it's a little bit higher maturity stuff. If only customers were more responsive. Again, some of this is from our enterprise services planning material, but we've codified it in the Kanban maturity model. If only we could prioritize better, we had better finer grain stories, we had direct access to customers, priorities didn't change so frequently, and planning wasn't so painful. That's our enterprise services planning stuff. 
Not everything is fixed with the Kanban maturity model. We've gone a long way, but it doesn't solve all the world's problems. If only we didn't measure the wrong things, we're organized differently, we had T-shaped people, we had true cross-functional teams, and we had capacity when we needed it. Well, the solution to these problems is codified in the Kanban maturity model. We have come a very long way with this tool. It's the most powerful enterprise agility tool on the market by a very long way. There's no such thing as bad Kanban, only in inappropriate practices. Let the Kanban maturity model be your guide and use it to hold your consultants accountable. Get some value for money for a change. And with that, thank you all very much.